Okay, thank you uh, to all of our participants. And we have our two panelists on, Rob Roy and Guy Adami. And we are very pleased uh, to have both of them with us. And I'm going to read just a very brief bio about both Guy and uh, Rob. Guy graduated from Georgetown University in 1986 with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. He began his career on Wall Street in June of 86 at Drexel Burnham Lambert in the Commodity and Currency Division. In 96, he joined Goldman Sachs as Vice President and Head Gold Trader at J. Aaron. 2005, CNBC approached Guy about a yet to be named show about Wall Street traders. Over the course of six months, CNBC interviewed over 400 individuals as potential panelists. In late 2006, Guy was selected with three other panelists to appear on CNBC's Fast Money. Today, after 14 years, Guy is the last remaining original member that appears on the show. Fast Money remains one of the most popular and regularly viewed shows on the network. Rob Roy, a 25-year veteran of the financial markets, heads up a growing team of analysts, of analysts and trading educators at Elliott Wave Options. As a chief trading strategist, he brings a lifetime of real world trading experience. Rob couples this with a unique ability to impact, uh, to impart seemingly complex information in a manner that even the most novice trader can understand. Rob has been an educator for over 20 years, lecturing and presenting at leading options education seminars and conferences in the United States, Asia, and Europe. Since 2009, Rob has added trade alerts to his educational offering as he has found that experience was far more valuable and powerful in contributing to the likelihood of a trader's ability to be successful. Rob is primarily responsible for the trade alerts generated for clients, including market analysis and case study selection. So with that uh, finished, uh, gentlemen, we are recording, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and thanks, Natalie, as well. And obviously, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I know how valuable everybody's time is, so we appreciate you spending yours with us. Rob, welcome. Fan of your work. First question to you before we get into our gold conversation and, and oh, all I'm the things. Sorry, Guy. I'm, I'm going to jump in real fast. I apologize for interrupting. Oh, Steve, can, okay. you, can you stop sharing your screen yeah. real quick? Sorry about that. Yep. Okay, there we go. go ahead. Thanks. Guys. Sorry, sorry about that. See, Natalie jumped in. Johnny on the yeah. spot, as they yep. say. As always. And welcome, everybody, again. So before we get into our gold conversation, I got to ask you, Rob, given the choice between a 1967 pre-Endura bumper GTO or a 69 Chevelle, what are you taking? Because I know you're a huge fan of the muscle cars. Yeah, you are correct there. And now uh, you've given me a, a pretty difficult choice there, but I got to go with the GTO. Gotta I agree. The, yeah. I agree that, you know, they ruined it when they put those Dora bumpers on, because as you know, they didn't hold paint, but I'm completely digressing here. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about that on another webinar, because I could do a series on that. But we also have to talk about what's going on in gold. And I got to tell you something. If you had told me everything, Rob, that's going to transpire over the last few months and then said, OK, where's the price of gold? I would have said we're significantly higher than that August of 20. I and maybe we're approaching $3,000 an ounce, but here we are floundering, you know, around 1750, 1800. Does this, I mean, I mean, does this make sense to you given uh, what's happened over the last few months? No, it actually makes no sense to me, which is one of the reasons I was excited about this. Cause I know you have some experience with uh, the gold in your history and I, I have no idea why. I mean, the number of things that we can go through and talk about, which should uh, bring gold price higher and it's not. So that's the subject of uh, what's wrong with gold. I thought was pretty appropriate. And looking at the GLD, the ETF, I mean, it's sitting right on support. I know you look right. at it as well. And if it, if it doesn't hold 160, then, um, then we're, we're going significantly lower, which it, it's all mind boggling to me. I don't, I don't understand it at all. So yeah, it would appear that way. And the levels you talk about is actually, you know, we've basically round turned over the course of a year, not really a year, probably closer to 10 and a half, 11 months, but gold broke out from effectively these levels in April of last year. We had 
move up to uh, the August all-time high. And then we've obviously been sort of meandering and slightly, or I shouldn't say slightly lower, precipitously lower ever since. And I will tell you, and I think you know this because you watch Fast Money, and this needs to be discussed because it's part of the story. I'm no fan of the Federal Reserve. I'm no fan of central bankers. And, and this is a conversation I'd love to have. But, you know, I think everything they've done, although probably well-intentioned, certainly well-intentioned, I think the outcomes are potentially disastrous. And as we sit here today, uh, you have a U.S. debt of a pro- approaching $28.5 trillion. And when we put this stimulus or relief bill through, it's going to be north of $30 trillion. So you're talking about GDP of maybe $21 trillion, best case, $22 trillion. So debt to GDP levels that we've never seen before in this country, um, all suggestive that the gold market should be not only flourishing, but should be you know significantly higher than the highs we saw last summer. So I ask you, is there a catalyst? Is there a, in your opinion, you know, what's the trigger to get this gold trade, which has been languishing back on its feet? Well, it... We, we did have a trigger that I thought was going to be the trigger, and that was Janet Yellen being uh, uh, appointed as the, the uh-huh. Treasury uh, Secretary, because, you know, she was at least widely regarded as a gold bug when she was the head of the Federal Reserve. And I, like you, am no fan of the Federal Reserve, been quite outspoken uh, against them. I did a seminar once in Washington where a lady that worked in the White House was there, and she put her arm around me, took me behind the screen, said, you need to watch what you're saying people that talk like you disappear. So I'm not a fan of the Federal Reserve either, nor the monetary policy of just continuing to, to print money. And we, that, I mean, we could spend probably, you know, an entire hour and a half talking about the Federal Reserve. But to answer your question, the trigger that I thought was, okay, Janet Yellen, that's going to be the catalyst. That's going to send gold moving, but it didn't. And so I, I actually don't know what catalyst there could be. I got a question for you. I'd be curious as Uh, with your expertise, what you feel. I know it's back and forth. Some people feel like interest rates have a lot to do with gold. Some people feel like interest rates have nothing to do with gold. Well, we had low rates for a while. That really wasn't the catalyst. Didn't Mm -hmm. rates got higher. That didn't help gold. Um, Do you have opinion on that, on whether interest rates have any effect on gold at all? I think that's a great question. I don't think they should necessarily. I think it's a completely different animal, but it's clear that they have had an effect. I think it's no coincidence that, you know, 10-year yields, which were 53 basis points at their trough in August, out either side of a percent and a half-ish. And Friday, this past Friday, we saw them spike up. I think I saw 1.56% for they sort of whacked them down to 1.41% month-end close. Uh, I think the naysayers will say, hey, you know what? Interest rates going higher doesn't really work for gold. What I would say, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, interest rates going higher is suggestive of inflation that is all around us, despite what the um, the Fed, the the Fed officials will say, despite what Jerome Powell will say. uh, There's nothing transitory about this, in my opinion. You know, we have inflation in all the wrong places. You know, they could say that there's this want to keep, you know, to have inflation sort of run hot for a period of time. But Bedded in that is the fact that they somehow think they can control it over a period of time. And I think that's genie out of the bottle. I mean, we're seeing ISM prices, uh, man, the, the ISM manufacturing data, we're seeing the, the PPI numbers come out extraordinarily hot. And for them to think that somehow this is transitory can be contained, in my opinion, is just folly. Uh, so I do think at a certain point, the gold market wakes up to that. But to answer your question, I do think the rise in rates has been really negative old. Yeah, it, it seems to have worked out that way. And I, I'm glad you brought up the PPI because I, I, I'm of the same uh, opinion there. You know, the Federal Reserve is saying we're not worried about their only thing. The only thing they say they're worried about is unemployment, right? They want to get employment back and, and they just keep uh, jawboning the fact that there, there's no inflation. But, you know, if you go to the grocery store, if you put gas in your car, you know, you know there's inflation and mm-hmm. yeah, the PPI is high. It's going to translate into the, the CPI as well. Uh, and yet they're still continuing this process of, uh, of pumping money, uh, liquidity every single month or every week, really, with the uh, auctions, et cetera. And it just seems like if there is inflation and excess liquidity, then at some point something has to give with gold. I mean, it, it can't just be bearish or negative on all fronts, can it? But it seems like it's been that way 
lately. So that that's the thing that I just, I can't understand it. Uh, I mean, I've, I've tried to talk about it and explain it. And I always felt like I had a decent understanding of gold, uh, but it hasn't seemed to uh, any of the historical norms with gold just aren't seem to be working right now. Yeah. But, and I, No, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I had another question for you because I, I'm sure you've heard this too. And by the way, on the interest rates, um, I watched the show where you were talking about, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that interest rates rising and where you thought the markets would really have a problem is if it got to 2% on the 10 year. Was that right? I mean, because I watch you every, every watch. Yeah, every you know, what I, what I thought, um, and I thought for what, well, I mean, I thought since let's call it the fall, it, it felt to me as though interest rates were going to start to move in a pretty significant way to the upside. And I thought all along we'd get to one and a half percent. And I've thought again that one and a half would be sort of that point of no return or that sort of point of diminishing marginal returns in terms of where the market would say interest rates going higher is a good thing. And then all of a sudden they'd say, wait a second, maybe it's not such a good thing. And I will tell you, if you looked at Friday's price action, which I know you did, you know, that moves through one and a half percent and then the subsequent pullback i mean it made sense in terms of you know prior support in the one and a half level over the last decade or so that is resistance and i think that's what we found ourselves but i do think we're going to start to ratchet our way through one and a half percent so two percent to me is a level that if we get there over the next couple of months the stock not going to like it at all but one and a half percent is the trigger to, to, to me rob so hopefully that answers your question but in terms of gold you know, I don't know if you, your work with Elliott Wave theories, I, I know you've done a lot of work with supportive of the price here. Does it suggest, you know, that next leg lower? Well, it, at this point in time, it, it, it's looking like the next leg lower. Uh, you know, there's, uh, I'm glad you brought up Elliott Wave because so many people just view Elliott Wave as that five wave directional pattern and a three wave corrective pattern, but it's so much deeper than that. And there's also, uh, uh, corrective patterns of which one is a triangle. And so now that 160 on the GLD has become support and obviously mm -hmm. is a descending triangle, uh, which, you know, more often than not, uh, people say breaks to the downside. I always try to view is that um, you need to protect both sides when you have a triangle. But the, the current pattern is suggesting um, not necessarily a downward move or an upward move, but it's suggesting that gold is getting ready to do something. And I just, I have no idea which way it's going to do, go. So uh, we, we trade the strangles and, and basically uh, they're well out of the money. We could get into that with, uh, you know, setting the Delta and Gamma where they have the greatest acceleration. So we don't do one strike out of the money. We go well out of the money where you have the greatest acceleration of the Delta curve when it moves. It's a pretty interesting strategy, which I think makes sense right now on gold because, uh, you know, I'm just, you know, bearing the bones here that I actually have no idea where gold goes from here. So, yeah, nor do I. I mean, I'd be perfectly. Yeah, I say it all the time. I have opinions, obviously, but I suggest that I'm right about anything. And that there are three certainties in life, death, taxes and my jump shot inside of 18 <laughs> feet. After that, all bets are off. But what I, you know, my pushback to you is obviously, you know, the move lower in gold has somewhat coincided with this astronomical move in specifically Bitcoin. And I don't necessarily want to go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, uh, but, you know, Bitcoin going from that 20,000 level, which was a prior high back in December of 2017, obviously exploded to close to 60,000, pulled back to 43,000. Now, at last I looked, we're either side of 50. Do you think that's taken away some of the um, I, I, some of the dollars that historically were, do you think they found their way into Bitcoin? That, that's a great question. And I actually was going to ask you the exact same question. So I will after I give you my answer, since you asked first. Um, obviously, the interest, I mean, all you hear is about Bitcoin. You guys on CNBC now have it on the, the ticker, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> how Bitcoin is on there. It's uh, it's such a hot topic. And my personal opinion, and uh, you may very well disagree, but my personal opinion is there's a lot of retail interest in it. But when you start talking about gold, you're getting into institutions, you're getting into the Federal Reserve, even though they claim they don't own gold, the Treasury owns gold. But I know the Federal Reserve shorts gold. And I, I, I do know an awful lot about the intricacies of the Federal Reserve, but again, maybe we'll come back on and, and have a whole session on the Fed. I would love that at, at some point in time. Um, but I just don't think the Federal Reserve, because they talked about, right, they talked about creating their own, um, you know, kind of cryptocurrency or yeah. digital currency, they called it. So I don't think they're playing in the world of Bitcoin. And so I just don't think that other than retail people that might have been, you know, in the past using gold as a safe haven, et cetera, uh, I just don't think the big institutions and and 
central banks are, are playing in the uh, in the Bitcoin world. And I, what's your opinion? I mean, maybe you disagree no, with me. Nor do I. I mean, I agree with you on that. I don't I don't think they're delving into it. You know, I don't know. And, and I would agree that, you know, if they were to do that, I think that actually would be extraordinarily bullish for gold. But, you know, it's another conversation. My, what I would say, though, in terms of uh, gold, physical gold, it's very interesting. And I ask people this question all the time and indulge me for a minute. And I'm not tinfoil wearing conspiracy theorist, but I just try to read the tea leaves. But if you own that 67 GTO and you put it up for sale, and somebody came to you, Rob, and said, I'll buy that car from you for you know, $25,000, but I don't want to take delivery of that car. I want to know that I own it, but I want you to hold on to it for me. And then an hour later, somebody calls up with the same sort of proposal to you. They say, Rob, love the car, give you 25 grand for it, but I don't want to take uh, delivery of it. I want you to hold it. You in perpetuity, right? You would make that type of deal because as long as you own that car, although others might take claim to it, it's your, you, know, you physically have the car. I mentioned that because I think you sort of spoke to something around this. You know, if you don't own the metal, it's effectively not yours. And, you know, if you had gold and you knew that you could sort of sell it in perpetuity because nobody's going to take ownership of it, you would do that. And I think to a certain extent, that's what we're seeing. And oh, by the way, if you don't think that's true in terms of ownership, Venezuela asked for their gold back about a year or so of gold. And the Bank of England said, uh, I'm not, I won't use the vernacular, but they basically said, yeah, too bad type of thing. So I think that <laughs> owning the physical metal is imperative. Now, I mentioned that because what we saw, you know, I, I, it's probably eight or nine months ago, we saw the front month crude contract go to a negative $39 a barrel-ish because this, the numbers suggested that it was cheaper to do that or more cost effective to do that than actually take delivery. I think at some point you could see the exact opposite in the gold market and maybe the silver market, which we can talk about, yeah. where people ask for delivery of the metal and there might not be any to give them. Thoughts on that? Yeah. I, I, again, you're asking me and the question I was going to ask you as far as the paper uh, uh, claims on gold versus what actually really exists. And you talk about Venezuela and, you know, there's conspiracy theories about uh, the fact that in the past with what we're doing uh, with the Federal Reserve continuing to authorize the Treasury, you know, I used to say the Federal Reserve, you know, just printing money and people say, oh, now the Treasury prints money. OK, well, if we have to be politically correct, yeah, Federal Reserve authorizes it, the Treasury prints money, but they're continuing all this uh, uh, printing and the liquidity that other countries have actually demanded that we pay our debts in gold. And so, you know, the, the conspiracy theories are out there that there is no gold. Uh, you know, the Federal Reserve says, well, we don't own it, the Treasury does. And, and so whether we do or not, I'm, I'm totally with you on you have to have possession of it. I'm 100% I'm uh, in agreement there. And I, I would like to move into the silver point at some time, but I like to know um, yeah, well, let's. So we, so we have a question from Matt J. Um, gold, and this I'm reading, so bear with me. Gold heads might see SLV being a similar store of wealth and also having the advantage of industrial usage. So it has the advantages of GLD and the industrial growth aspect of shifting buyers. I'm just reading Does silver behave like gold in a downturn slash inflation? Uh, I'll ask that to you. I'll give a shot at it as well. But thank you for your question, Matt. And by the way, folks, if you do have questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I'll be on the lookout for them, as will Natalie and Steve. So, Rob, we'll talk about silver now. Um, yeah. The same, same, some of the same attributes of gold. Plus, you know, there is an industrial use aspect of this as well. Yeah, and um, that's an excellent question that Matt asked there as far as is silver going to be the same thing and then the industrial use of silver. And uh, I've been talking in some YouTube videos, et cetera, about how, you know, in the past, and I know you know this as well, that gold used to be the leader, right? Silver was the, the little brother or stepbrother and he followed along. It does, it seems like things have, have reversed now that silver is a leader, maybe because of the industrial use. And that may be the thing that keeps it from, um, 
falling into the same trap as gold. That's that's my opinion. I also wanted to mention I don't really want to give you know a, a shout out to him at all. But the, you know I was long SLV and then the the whole you know Reddit guys on the uh, silver squeeze etc. And and they were going to try that was their uh, modus operandi right. There was too many paper demands for the actual silver and they were going to create this big silver squeeze squeeze and you know it opened higher and I actually took that opportunity to get out. Uh, of silver so that was a great morning for me but then it sold back off and you know we found out that, uh, that those guys don't have as much power as they think they do but uh it, the interesting part of the whole thing though was their theory was you know there's more paper demands on silver just like there's likely more paper demands on gold as well but in my opinion and then i'll you know give it to you for yours is that um silver will likely stay a little stronger than gold due to the fact that it's in a lot of electronics etc and anyway uh, more than yeah. just we like wearing it on our you know our hands and necks and no maybe, without, without know, question and look i mean we're seeing you know we're talking about copper at almost historic levels i mean steel prices are through the roof um there's nickel demand i mean all across you know, the base metals compound, aluminum cans having trouble sourcing aluminum to make. Aluminum. So you, you wonder at a certain point, I mean, it, you know, demand is manifesting itself in those metals for obvious reasons. I mean, there is demand and the reason, you know, you have inflation on the back of that. If you just look at that complex you know, gold, I've never thought of gold as a commodity. And, and maybe we can have this conversation, you know, commodities are things that have an end use. And to a certain extent, silver does have an end use. Yeah. I mean, people will say gold has an end use in the form of jewelry, but you understand what I'm saying. I mean, crude oil has an end right. use, natural gas, aluminum, nickel, zinc, um, soybeans, corn, wheat, all those things, there is an end use. So there's, a, there's an understanding of the supply and demand thing. Gold is sort of its own animal. You know, I guess my question back is, are we just sort of is it is this sort of the darkest before the dawn, or am I just looking at this the wrong way? And I, again, I want to be try to I, I try to keep my dogma out of it, but it's very hard at times to do that. But I'm trying not to be dogmatic and just look at it and say, you know what, in a world where the demand is there, inflation is all around us. And oh, by the way, um, every central bank around, around the planet is doing their best to debase their currency. How can gold not win in that environment? It is hard to imagine. And, and, you know, going back to the beginning of our conversation, it's hard to imagine that gold is where it is now. Is it the darkest before the dawn? I'd like to think so. But again, I, I really don't know. And I do uh, agree with your analogy 100 percent or your conversation with, you know, silver having a real use. And gold's just it's kind of a luxury item. Right. I mean, we like it for jewelry and uh, and gifts and stuff like that. But silver is, is actually being used in electronics and things. So it does have a real use. And and so I do feel like uh, silver is the leader and, and likely can move higher, but I'm, the primary conversation being gold. And if it breaks down from here, that it's going to, you know, the market shocks me all the time, but this would be something that would really be mind boggling. I, I really think it tries to hold here, but I don't know, you know, yeah. the darkest before and, the dawn, I, I have and, to go back. I just don't know. I, nor do I. And it's coincided. Listen, this, you know, this move lower in gold is coincided with the dollar. You know, for those of you that follow the DXY, I mean, that that 90 level in the DXY has been support. I mean, I, I know the 88 level, but you know, it, it's, it's held fast. Um, I'm one of these people that believe that, you know, the dollar's headed precipitously lower over the next few months. And Citibank put out a note uh, towards the end of 2020. I want to say it was in October, November, where they saw a potential decline in the U.S. dollar this year. And, and I agree with that. You know, what's going on in terms of um, all the, you know, just terms of the stimulus package, relief package, whatever you want to call it. And again, I mentioned that the U.S. debt is now 28 trillion on its way to 30 uh, over GDP. That's just, you know, stagnant. If met, you know, maybe sort of grind higher. So you have a numerator that continues to go up. You have a denominator that's stubbornly low. And by definition, I would think that's going to lead to something in the form of a dollar going lower. But the dollar hangs in there. Maybe it's just sort of a, you know best best house in a bad neighborhood type of thing but what are your, your views on the dollar because to a certain extent if you have a gold view you also have to have a u.s dollar view 100 percent agree and uh, actually that was one of the subjects that i wanted to get into as well so you led, led right into it and uh you know that's another thing right we talk about interest rates the other factors of gold the dollar is a big one so if the dollar going down is normally considered to be bullish for gold it hasn't worked out 
that way this time either. You know, mm-hmm. the dollar went down in November and December, went straight down. Gold actually went down in November. It rebounded in December, but by the time we finished November and December, gold was exactly where it was when it started, but the dollar was much lower. And I agree with you, the dollar is trying to find support here. And, you know, your question of, is this the darkest before the dollar? Well, if the dollar does make a rebound, does that push gold through that support? And then, and then it gets even uglier for gold. I, you know, it's just, um, that, that's why this whole subject matter, I think was interesting is because nothing makes sense when it's coming to gold right now. I just don't get it. I mean, I know the central bank's short gold, so I know that, but why are they, I mean, are they really pushing it down at this point? I actually wanted to ask you a question. This is going back to a subject before, but um, when, when interest rates were going up, obviously, you know, 1.5, that was your line in the sand. And then you, I think you said that 2% would be really nasty for the stock mm-hmm. market and you reiterated that here. Um, but do you think that was there any central bank intervention when interest rates were skyrocketing? I mean, I, one and a half is, yeah, that's the, the, the line in the sand, so to speak. But wasn't it the trajectory of interest rates that was freaking the market out a little yeah, bit? Yeah, well, that's what scared rate? me. I mean, yeah. you talk, yeah, I mean, you have a great point. It's not so much the absolute yield. I mean, one and a half percent, I think you would agree, most people would, that you're still talking about historically really low interest rates. And that's, I, mean, I, I can't push back on that. That's just truth. It's the speed with which we got there. I mean, we went from 53 basis points in August to one and a half percent now. So we actually you can do the math. I mean, we've tripled here much less than a year. And that to me, problematic. It's the volatility in the bond market about something that is it is just vis-a-vis. It's probably the most liquid um, security in the history of mankind. Yet right. here we are, something that's tripled. If we had seen the similar volatility in the equity market, we'd be talking about it every day. Do I think central banks have intervened in some way? I have no way of knowing. What I will tell you is the market believes that somehow our Federal Reserve can control the bond market. They can control the front end of the curve. They can't control anything else. And to think that they can, or if they believe that they can, is just folly. And I encourage people to the extent that you watch many series, um, you should watch I think it was a six-part miniseries on HBO a year or two or so ago. And I bring that up because the last episode takes place in the control room after midnight of Chernobyl. They were going to run a test, they being the engineers in the room. And in order to do the test, they had to basically shut down, which they did. And then they tried to bring the reactor back up and it wouldn't do it. The reactor would not come back online. So one by one, uh, this one gentleman in particular started to take out or ask for the control rods to be taken out in order to get a reaction. And they did that until all the control rods were taken out. Then, of course, they got a reaction that they couldn't control. And when they tried to put the control rods back in, it was too late. And I bring that analogy because I think that's what's happened here. I think our central bank, our Federal Reserve, has taken all the control rods out in hope of getting a reaction, the reaction in this case being inflation, but be careful what you wish for, because once you get it, you're not going to be able to control it. And they can try to put the control rods in in the form of, you know, adjusting their rates. But it's going to be too late. I mean, is that a ridiculous analogy? Does that make sense, Rob? Oh, no, it makes total sense because and I actually like that. And I'll probably borrow that if you don't mind. Take it. Go ahead. Because <laughs> I think it's really good. But here's my concern is that I do think the Federal Reserve feels that they can control the long end. And uh, I just wonder with, you know, they, I'm totally agree with, with you as far as they want to create inflation. They want interest rates to go up to a point and, you know, a little bit of a creep higher would be great because it's signaling that the economy is getting better, but yet rates aren't getting out of control. And so, you know, everything can work well in that scenario. But the fact that it went vertical scared everybody. And I was just wondering if they came in and, and tried to calm that 10 year down a little bit. But I, I'm, I'm over the concern that they think they can control the long end, but I agree with you, they can't. And, and that's my biggest concern with interest rates. And I think that's why we, uh, as uh, equity traders or derivative yeah. traders, need to really be on our toes as far as where things can go from here. But can I ask you, I know you have uh, limited time here before you have to leave for your show, but uh, your thoughts on the dollar? I mean, I mentioned you know, the dollar went down and, and gold basically was flat between the November and December. What, what is your thought on the yeah. dollar? Because that's a relationship that-, that a lot of people equate with gold. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think you're going to see, listen, if the stock market's on the precipice of something, and again, I have no idea, but obviously it's a little sloppy close today. The last week has been interesting. You've seen the VIX sort of creep higher. 
you know, if there's going to be some sort of event in the equity market, you're going to see a flight to quality in the form of people going into the U.S. dollar. We saw it, and I'm not suggesting this is last March by any stretch, but you saw it obviously last March when the equity market melted down, the flight to quality was in the form of bonds and the U.S. dollar. That proved to be the wrong thing to do, by the way, in the, in the, in the flight to quality. And I think you might be sort of seeing that now, you know, people flight to quality in the form of the U.S. dollar, uh, that's going to be short-lived in my opinion. If this, if everything sort of manifests, I think it will, any rally in the dollar is going to be short lived. I think the dollar is going to continue that trajectory lower. I think interest rates are going to go higher still. And you're going to have this witch's brew of a lower dollar, higher, higher interest rates. And that's nobody's going to like that, in my opinion. But that's just me sort of back of the envelope stuff. So, again, if you're looking for level from myself, it, it comes one and a half percent in 10 years. My line in the sand. We'll see what happens. Uh, that 88 level in the DXY is the line in the sand on the downside. We'll see what happens if and when we get there. And what does that mean for the equity market? And subsequently, are we going to see a move in the gold market? I think you're going to see that move in the gold market. But as, as we like to say, um, you know, gold has been a widow maker for decades. And why shouldn't it do it again this time? But I do, you know, I hate to use the term. It's different this time. Well, there are a lot of weird things going on in the world, Rob. So maybe it is different this time. What's not different, unfortunately, is the fact that I got to go put makeup on to be on our show at five. <laughs> but I'm going to leave it in your very capable hands. I want to thank everybody for having allowing me to do this. Thank you, Rob, for your time. Thank all of our uh, people that joined. Natalie and Steve, thank you. I'm going to have to hop, but I'm going to let you guys know if that's okay. Thanks very much, thank guy. Thank you, Guy. Absolutely. Thanks, guy. Appreciate your time. Yeah. Great. Okay, Rob, uh, we will continue with you. Uh, just from the Q&A and chat box, we do have two remaining questions. Then I have a, a few questions uh, in our new topic area. Uh, and all the uh, participants, please stay with us. Uh, Rob's got some excellent additional information. But uh, so Rob, is the popularity and interest in Bitcoin the reason for gold being down in your opinion? Uh, I'm curious as to when the question was asked because we kind of talked about that when we were going through it. And my, my opinion is that I think there's a lot of retail interest in Bitcoin and maybe some uh, institutional interest, but not on a big scale. But when you really get into gold, gold is affected by central banks. And yeah, I don't think the central banks are playing in Bitcoin at all. In fact, the Federal Reserve has come out and said, you know, they're intrigued by the idea of a digital currency and they're likely, they are not going to get behind Bitcoin. In my, this is my opinion. The Federal Reserve or other central banks will not back Bitcoin, but they will uh, try to create some sort of a digital currency on their own that they have more control over because the Federal Reserve likes to be in control of things. They control, you know, money now. And if money begins shifting to digital currency and, and uh, things like Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, they're not going to want to... Uh, you know, participate in something that they don't feel they can control. So um, I, I think it, it's, it's been more of a retail phenomenon with some, you know, minor interest by institutions you know, from a trading standpoint, because it's been a good trade, obviously, to be long Bitcoin. But I don't see the big central banks playing in there. And so I think what will happen is Bitcoin will do well, and it'll probably be the crypto of choice until the central banks get together and that's what I, this is my opinion again, but that's what I think is going to happen is the Federal Reserve and, and the other central banks are going to get together and they're going to create their own cryptocurrency. Remember the, all the old uh, rumors, um, the old conspiracy theories that there was going to be a one currency, right? Everybody, they all, they were going to get together and they were going to create just one currency and that never materialized. But this is a, a, a time when I think that, you know, a, a central bank type backed uh, digital currency could become a reality. And I think that's going to be problematic, problematic for Bitcoin moving forward. But right now they are the leader. They're the game in town. So. Terrific. Yeah. The gentleman that asked that may have jumped in uh, after you and Guy uh, covered it the first time. Okay. We do have one other question before our transition. Now I am not a hundred percent sure what this question means the question itself, but it just says real interest rates, question mark. Uh, yeah, that was, yeah. that was, 
Go ahead. That, that was actually one other topic that I wanted to get in with Guy, but I mean, we had such a good conversation. We just ran out of time, but that was the last thing that I wanted to cover is real interest rates, which for people that may not understand what real interest rates are, it's interest rates minus inflation. And, you know, we talked about how there is underlying inflation that you know, the central banks just want to stick their head in the sand like an ostrich and pretend that there isn't any, but real interest rates are negative. And so when you take interest rates minus inflation, it, they're still negative. Negative rates are supposed to be bullish for gold. That hasn't been bullish for gold either. So again, I would have loved to have hear, heard uh, guys comment on that. We just put uh, limited time, but um, yeah, that's an, it's an excellent question, comment, whatever, uh, whatever it was. Uh, so hopefully everybody understands now when, when you hear the conversation about real rates, that's what they're talking about. Interest rates minus inflation. They're negative. I can actually show you a chart uh, of it because I had one in case we got to that point. Um, and historically, that's been really bullish for gold. Nothing has worked. Nothing has been bullish for gold. And so that's the, the, the thing that's... Um, you know, made for our subject matter today. It, it, it's hard to understand why gold is sitting at the levels that it is. There's, you can't make any sense of it from any of the historical metrics. Well, I guess uh, we'll keep trying to figure it out. Uh, but uh, for all of our attendees, we're going to make a slight shift here. Uh, Rob is going to discuss uh, his Elliott Waves uh, Elliott Wave Options Service. And uh, uh, Rob, would you like to give us just a little bit of an introduction on what is Elliott Wave Options and what services do you provide within Elliott Wave Options? Sure. Uh, Elliott Wave Options, and by the way, our website is ewotrader.com, ewotrader.com for Elliott Wave Options.com. Uh, and we offer uh, uh, extraordinary education on the world of trading options. We have an alert service as well, where we send out alerts in two primary portfolios. One is the impulse portfolio, which is directional trading. Um, most people view directional trading within LA Wave as the one, two, three, four, five uh, patterns, and then you have the three wave corrective pattern, but it's so much deeper than that. And one of the things that uh, I also wanted to, to talk about with uh, whatever time we have is a zigzag pattern, which is it's known as a corrective pattern within Elliott Wave, but it's a three wave pattern uh, where it's an ABC labeled. So you don't have to wait as long. So for those of you that like, uh, you know, everything is, uh, you know, we want it now, right? We're the, we, we need things now type of a society. And so if you feel that way and you like shorter term trading, then the zigzag pattern is great. It's still directional pattern, still works very similar. It's impulses. There's an impulse A, a corrective B, and an impulse C. And, um, it, but you, you can put on directional trades uh, that are shorter term, uh, but still staying within the LA wave parameters. The other thing, which I think gold ties into right now, because you heard Guy and I both say, neither one of us really have any idea where gold's going to go from here. Uh, we have a, a volatility portfolio, which is looking for consolidating patterns, primarily strangles. Uh, and uh, we look for triangle patterns. Uh, symmetrical ascending and descending triangles because those are good consolidation patterns. And when you see a triangle, that's where the market's telling you. We have no idea where things are going to go, but it's due for a breakout. So with our proprietary triangles, the way we set them up, set them up to where you're mathematically guaranteed to make money as fast as possible if it breaks out. So I want to be clear here. I'm not saying it's mathematically guaranteed to make money. I'm not saying that at all. It still has to break out. I'm saying if the stock makes a break, we set the math in our favor. So um, with, with that in a, in a situation where you look at GLD and you're like, I have no idea what it's gonna do. We're sitting at support. We've had descending uh, highs, lower highs. Strangle makes a lot of sense in that scenario where you just sit back and say, I don't care which way it breaks. So we can you know, talk and have conversations of uh, where we think it can go, what's wrong with it. But in the end, uh, a strategy like that, you don't really care. Uh, so that's the premise of what we offer. But again, I, I don't want to make light of the education either. If some people uh, have heard about LA Wave, if they feel like they have a basic knowledge of it, we take somebody that's just heard the words LA Wave through the educational program and take them to where uh, they consider themselves to be in the upper echelon of uh, education on LA Wave. And then again, uh, the alert service that we offer where we'll send out alerts on what we're doing 
within LA Wave and they can choose to follow along in their own accounts if, if they'd like to. So um, thanks for letting me go through that. That's uh, in the gist what we offer. Absolutely. That uh, your uh, description was fascinating to me. Uh, before I get to my next question, I do want to remind all of our attendees that you will be getting an email tomorrow from Option Hotline. And again, please whitelist Option Hotline in your email client so that you be sure to get not only the email tomorrow, but all of our emails. And in that email, you will get a uh, a link to the recording of this, and you will also get a link to a free giveaway from Rob, uh, which is his Trade Finder service that's in the Elliott Wave uh, service website. So uh, look for that email tomorrow. Okay, Rob, uh, next question. Uh, at this time, your track record is uh, a pretty phenomenal 500% uh, non compounded growth over the last three years. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the strategies you've used to achieve this uh, amazing number? Yeah, thanks for, uh, for asking about that. We are pretty proud of the uh, performance that we've had. And it is important to note that that's not compounded. So uh, if you had a compounded number, it would be, you know, an extreme multiple of that. And the, the way that works, because people say, well, what does that mean exactly? Well, uh, we have the two portfolios, right? The uh, impulse and the um, volatility portfolio are the two primary portfolios. And so we talk about a recommendation of starting with a, an account of 5,000 in each, so 10,000 total. And then we've grown from there. Now, the reason that we show our results from a non-compounded basis is we add new subscribers all the time. And so if you put on a trade and you generated a gain, and so our risk management is uh, roughly right around 5% of your account at risk in any one alert that we send out. So no more than 5% and we're buyers of options so that we have a fixed limited risk. We never do anything that puts someone in a position for a margin call or uh, unlimited risk scenario. So everything is fixed risk. So if it's about a 5% uh, target of the uh, $10,000 account, that's $500 into uh, any uh, an individual alert. Well, if we go through a period of time and we've made some profits and the account's grown, say you know, the account's 12,000, 13,000 now, and we're still staying with 5%, well, now we're at greater than you know, $500 at risk per trade. And that really isn't fair for the new people that we're adding. We add new subscribers all the time. So if somebody comes in and maybe they don't have a large account, maybe they don't have a $10,000 account, they only have 5,000 and they pick one of the two strategies to, to utilize. Uh, and so um, if we're uh, putting on alerts, still staying at that 5% metric, but then that 5% is like $800 now of risk then that would be more than 5% for somebody, it'd be more than 10% for somebody that just had a single account. So that's why it's important that we show our results on a non-compounded basis. As far as the strategies, it's a combination of both of those two portfolios that I talked about, the impulse and the volatility. Um, they they uh, complement each other very nicely. Right. And can you talk a little bit more? Um, you suggest that your subscribers use the hybrid strategy, a uh, combination of the main two strategies. Can you talk just a little, I, I mean, we, uh, we heard you what you just said about it. Can you talk just a little bit more about it? Yeah, uh, that's, that's actually a, a great question. The hybrid strategy is a combination of both. So with the impulse portfolio, we do highly recommend that our subscribers utilize both. And here's a perfect example of it with what we've gone through in this last year, right? So the impulse portfolio is directionally based. Even with LA Wave, primarily directionally based trades are gonna follow the market, right? Most stocks follow the market, as I'm sure you're aware. So when the market's moving to the upside, the majority of the impulse uh, trades are gonna be to the upside. So they're gonna be upward directionally based. Well then, something like February of last year happens when you know COVID, the COVID scare, the shutting everything down and the market made a significant drop uh, in February and then dropped again down into March. I mean, it was a massive drop in a very short period of time. Well, obviously those upward based uh, impulse trades had to be reversed. So there was a period where they experienced a loss where you could take off the uh, 
long based or upward based and turn them around into a, uh, a bearish based trade. Uh, and so you're gonna experience some losses there. And I, I'm, I'm sure you're aware there, there were actually hedge funds that got wiped out with that, you know, leveraged funds um, that the, the market fell so fast they couldn't meet the margin calls and, and they actually got liquidated. And I, I have a friend that had a long standing hedge fund that actually got liquidated during that time frame. Well, if you look at our performance graph on our website, and again, you can see it right on the front of the website, um, you will notice that there was just a little blip down in our equity curve. The reason for that is the volatility portfolio. That's those strangles that I was talking about where we're buying a call and buying a put, which means that every one of those positions has a long put in it. So when the market started tanking and the impulse trades that were upward based weren't doing very well, uh, to put it mildly, the volatility portfolio took over and those puts were making money like crazy out of those strangles on the way down. And so that protected the portfolio. So I view that as not only do we do risk management as far as risk protection, but having the volatility portfolio is added risk protection in case things move to the downside. And in case something unusual like what happened with February and March with the, uh, the COVID scare, uh, which you know, scared the market, and uh, so all that just turned out to be a little bit of a blip and we immediately recovered and, and continued to move on to the upside. So multiple layers of ways that you can protect your portfolio. That's why I think having both of those, which is what we call the hybrid. So you have the directionally based. And, and here, here's, here's the thing, Stephen, here's the reason that we feel the need to highlight this. If you look at the two performances, the sexy stuff is in the impulse portfolio, right? There's no doubt that you can make more on being right on a directionally based trade, especially in the world of options with the leverage. There's no question about that. With the strangles, we have a call and we have a put. We're expecting the stock to move. We don't know which way. Well, when it does move, one of those options is losing money while the other one is making money. And we set it up again, mathematically to where the option that's making money makes money as fast as possible, where the other one that's losing money is losing money as slowly as possible. But you still can't get away from the fact that one's making money, one's losing money. So the percentage return on average is going to be less in the volatility portfolio. So when someone new comes in and looks at that, they're like, oh, well, I'm just going to do the impulse portfolio. Look at those returns. That's what I want. But then if they're only in the impulse portfolio and then something like February happens, well, their results are going to be a bit worse than those that had both and they were protected by the volatility portfolio. So when things went to the downside, all those puts were making money. So we had all those strangles that are profitable while the market's tanking and the impulse trades were not doing well. So it really is an important thing. And I understand where you know people come from and they look at it and they're like, well, why would I pick the volatility over the impulse when the returns are better than the impulse? You have to look at the whole picture and you have to understand that. And, and we got a great example of that last year, unexpected things happen. Elliott Wave is great as far as when a pattern goes and if it were to fail, it relabels. And so we will make adjustments according with that. And that all works out fine. But then something severe happens like uh, the market tanking with, uh, with the COVID thing. It allows you to sleep at night so that you're not worried about what's that unforeseen thing that could occur in the markets that I haven't planned for. Because that's, that's what happens, right? I mean, you, you, you make your trading plan, you feel like you've done good on your risk management, but then the thing that eats at you is, I know there's something that, you know, that I haven't planned for, or there's something that is not factored into the market. The market looks six to nine months ahead. A lot of things are already factored in to the market, but there are things that occur. It's just a fact of life that are unexpected. This allows you to sleep at night, knowing that if something unforeseen happens, if something unexpected happens, you're covered, you're protected. Yeah, we might have a losing month here or there, but it's going to be minimal and we recover right away and move on. Excellent. Excellent. How was uh, that for a long one? It's a, it's a good one. <laughs> it's a good one. Uh, so uh, in just one sec, I'm going to ask you to move over to the zigzag mastery trading course, but uh, very briefly, uh, we know you've introduced some new high value trading alerts. Uh, can you uh, just very, very briefly cover, uh, cover that? 
Okay, yeah, and I will, I will do my best to be brief at this point in time. Natalie will tell you that being brief is not my forte, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do my best here. Uh, basically, that was a suggestion from our subscribers. So we talk about maintaining that $500 of risk per alert. Well, the market's run up for a while, right? So there are a lot of stocks that are high dollar stocks that would form those nice symmetrical triangles. So it started in the volatility portfolio and then we moved it over into the impulse as well. Uh, but that would form these great triangles. And it's very important with our strangle strategy that we pick a specific delta. That's where the math works in our favor. Well, there was no way with some of these expensive stocks like Tesla was one, to give you an example, it had an amazing triangle formation in it, but it was too expensive. In order to put the correct strangle on that kept the math in our favor, it was way above that $500. Well, some of our subscribers were writing in saying, well, I've got a larger account. I would be okay with putting on a larger trade than a $500 risk trade. What can we do? And so in discussing that, I found out that a lot of our subscribers felt that way. And so we created the high value part, which is those are the ones that we exceed that $500 of risk. And then we, we say, you know, it, it would be best to have a 20 or $25,000 account to move into those so that you still maintain some discipline from your risk management standpoint. But it allows people with larger accounts to participate in some of those, you know, higher dollar stocks that have the exact same uh, patterns in them that lower dollar stocks do. We just can't maintain that $500 of risk per alert with them. So that's where that came from. Great. And thank you for throttling yourself just a little bit. Now, can you just uh, segue? <laughs> it was hard, into... but I did. <laughs> <laughs> can you uh, segue? Uh, those of you who are still with us, you will be getting an email tomorrow with a free gift and also information about Rob's zigzag mastery trading course. Rob, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, what I thought I would do is if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take the screen. If that's yeah, okay. please do. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully everybody is seeing my screen now. So what I'm going to go through is a real brief introduction into the zigzag. Just spend a few minutes on this. Go through it real quickly. Uh, but you know what, Rob? Sorry to inter inter interrupt you, but I'm not seeing your screen. Um, Steve, are you seeing it? We're, we're, no, we're seeing you. Right, there you go. Yep. There, there it is. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I forgot to click a button. So thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Appreciate it. Uh, so I'll run through this real quickly, which is just more of an introduction. We call this the core part uh, in our education. This is right off our website. But the zigzag mastery class is if this is interesting to you, we're going to go deeper into it uh, in the zigzag mastery class and really give you a great understanding of the power of this uh, pattern. Uh, it, it went to the downside. There was a zigzag to the downside. Uh, during the uh, fall in February from COVID, when we rebounded in March, it turned around and went right back into an upper one. So you could have gone down and then up. Uh, and uh, we have a great manual that goes along with the zigzag mastery class. So you'll have written versions of this. You don't have to worry about copying the slides, et cetera. We're putting together a really in-depth manual with lots of examples of it. So let me just run through what a zigzag is real quickly. So there's that three-wave pattern that I talked about. So it's three segments, not five. So it's quicker. So here you have an A impulse. Now, the reason I show this to the downside, it can be to the upside as well, is most people when they view the word correction like a corrective move, they're thinking of a downward move, right? Usually we associate correction with a downward move. Elliot's world is a corrective move, is a move against the previous impulse. So here this move was an impulse down and the corrective move was the B wave to the upside. So the actual correction was higher and then the C wave extension. So that's in general what it is. It is the most common corrective patterns. There's three of them, flat zigzags and triangles, but in this uh, course and in this example, we're only covering the zigzags labeled ABC rather than one, two, three, four, and five, but it subdivides into five, three, five, which basically means the A wave has a five wave pattern within it. The B wave has a three wave pattern within it. And then the C wave has a five wave pattern within it. So there you can be bullish or bearish. So you can have upwards or downward uh, zigzag patterns. It doesn't matter which way the market's going. Um, and here uh, we talk about Elliot all the time has listing of rules and guidelines. Rules are hard and fast. If a rule is broken, the pattern becomes disqualified. 
So that's why it's important to understand what the rules are. So the rules you can see on general price, we don't get into channels with zigzags, degree, uh, gross price and time. Those all have rules associated with them. So that'll be in the course. And then over on the guidelines, these are things like watch for this. This happens a lot of the time. So, you know, it gives you kind of a guidance of what to look for. But if it's not in place, that doesn't mean the pattern is going to be disqualified. So that's the difference between rules and guidelines. And so here are some of the uh, um, rules. So you can see this is a rule. The uh, B must be at least 20% of wave A. So the corrective move has to come down at least 20%. And B should never replace, uh, should retrace at least 30% of wave A. So the rule is 20, the guideline is 30. So if you see it come down a little bit further, in fact, I like it to come down at least to the 38.2% fib level is the one that I really look at. B must be shorter in price than A. That makes sense, right? So this is a corrective move. Uh, if you have B that comes down and it's the same length as A, then at that point in time, you're looking at a flat pattern, which is a different correctional pattern. It's not directionally based. So the, the B wave, as you can tell, is important to watch what happens with B. That's how we set the trade up with a zigzag. We look for, okay, there was an impulse move in the A. We don't trade that. Then we watch the corrective move B. Does it fall within our rules? Is it within our guidelines? Uh, and so that gives us an idea of where is the entry. So what we're looking to do uh, is to trade this move to the upside on the C wave. That's where the trade is. So we let A form and B form and we're following along and trading that C wave. So look, C must be longer than 90% of B. So that's already telling you that the C wave move is gonna be pretty substantial. So there's nice gains that can be generated from these smaller patterns. And, and while I'm at it, uh, I wanna make sure that I'm clear here that this pattern can work regardless of the time frame you're looking at in the market. Obviously, the majority of us talk about end of day, right? We look at daily charts, so end of day data. But on an intraday basis, when I'm looking at the charts, I look at three minute charts. That's how I follow the market intraday. Well, these patterns work on three minute charts as well. And I had a friend always tell this story I think, real quick that uh, he landed in Orlando. I live in central Florida, he landed in Orlando. His flight was canceled. I said, hey, can I come uh, bunk for the night? And came over and started showing them the zigzag pattern. He was a futures trader. That's what he did. He traded the E-mini futures. So we started talking about the zigzag pattern. And the next morning we got up early before he was supposed to go to his flight. And we found a few of them and they worked out really well. And he stayed the entire day. He purposely missed his next flight uh, because he was getting a better grasp of how this worked. So whether you trade futures, currencies, whether you trade intraday, whether you trade end of day, it's a pattern that works regardless. So um, when you see that and moving past the uh, um, 90%, then you know that uh, uh, you've got a confirmed C wave, but we're already in the position at that point in time. Now, you may wonder, well, how do we know how far that C is going to go? That's a great question. Well, there's guidelines and rules that go along with that. And so in general terms, the C is gonna be very similar in length to A. So we do have some rules depending on how far the B wave corrects, uh, but in general terms, it's gonna be um, C is similar in price to A. So all you have to do is, as shown on the screen here, is you measure, okay, how far do we from zero to A? And then when the B ended, how far is that exact same move from the beginning of the C wave to the end? that gives you your price target. And there's a number of different option strategies that you can set up to take advantage of that with where the C is gonna go. Often we'll do an out of the money butterfly if it uh, uh, works out. Sometimes we would do call spreads. Sometimes we just do straight calls. It all depends on what option trade works best for that given scenario. But the key is you have an idea of where that C is gonna go and it's uncanny how well that works. You might think, okay, well, that's a guideline. This is a guideline on the slide. So it must be that that's, um, you know, just kind of uh, uh, uncertain that it's going to hit there. But I, I, I could actually view that as more of a rule because it is amazing how well that C wave uh, moves to the same distance as the A. And so here are some uh, Fibonacci percentages that we utilize. Second is most likely uh, link for the wave C is 61.8%. 
and then the third most likely is 161.8. So when we get to this extension of the C wave, meaning that C has gone further than the length of A, that's what an extension means. So the C wave has gone further than the length of the A wave. That's where we bring in some confirming indicators. I've got other confirming indicators. So we don't trade only LA wave. LA wave is the basis, but there's no one indicator that's the holy grail of indicators. I've always said that if, if I had to choose between uh, any indicators and I could only use one, LA wave would be it. But LA wave, as good as it is on its own, is even better when we complement it with some other indicators and so especially when you have a zigzag pattern and it's reached its target, there are scenarios where it goes to the next FIB level, that's the extended C. But that's where we rely a lot on our confirming indicators to say, is it still strong or is it running out of gas? If it's running out of gas, then that's probably the end of the move. But if it's still really strong, then, hey, we're likely gonna go up and hit that extended move. So we're gonna take all of these subjects in the zigzag mastery class and go deeper. Now I've given you just a real quick in the time frame that I have and I'm trying to uh, be good and finish on time, uh, which is a rarity for me, but uh, that just gives you a, a bit of an idea of how the pattern works. And again, uh, we'll have you know four sessions to get deeply into this and really give you great detail on, uh, on how the zigzag works and how you can incorporate it into your own trading. Even if you're not a massive Elliott Wave fan, um, you have to, you have to have some sort of a uh, admission that Fibonacci ratios are uncanny on how they act for support and resistance. But if you give it a chance, you take a look at it and then you say, yeah, th there, there's a lot to this. And, and I think this could be one of my favorite strategies as well. Promise you that there'll be a lot of energy and passion in the course because it is my favorite directional pattern. So thanks, Steve, for letting me uh, give you a quick rundown on what that's going to be. Well, our pleasure, and thank you. I know I'm going to have to go back to the recording. There was so much information in this yeah, webinar. Sorry, I know it was quick. I, but, uh, yeah, no, no, it was, <laughs> it was it was great, but I'm definitely going to go back. Um, Rob, you're welcome to stick around. I'm going to take the screen back, but before you go, uh, we certainly want to thank you again. Is there any uh, last words that you'd like to mention to uh, the – we still have a pretty fair amount of attendees with us. Anything lastly that you'd like to add? Uh, no, I, I appreciate the time. I appreciate uh, uh, you guys uh, having me and, um, and, and the conversation with Guy. Uh, thank you for all. I would uh, encourage everybody, go to our website, ewotrader.com, sign up for this uh, LA Wave Mastery class, and I look forward to having you. Um, I, I do think that it's uh, a, a really vital part of anybody's technical trading system. Terrific. Well, once again, we thank you. Thank you. We hope you'll come back and uh, visit us again on a webinar. And uh, again, you're welcome to stick around, but you're also welcome to uh, take off. We know you're busy. So thanks very much, Rob. Thank you so much, Sam. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. And you Natalie bet. as well. Appreciate right. it. I'm going to grab the screen back here. Oh. Uh, great. Okay. So, uh, to all of you, I will, I will remind you that you will be getting uh, an email tomorrow that will have not only a link to a free giveaway that we've been talking about, and that'll be Rob's Trade Finder service, uh, but also there will be uh, a link to, uh, to the classes that, uh, to the class he was just talking about and a way for you to sign up for that. So, um, uh, be sure that you look for that email tomorrow. And also please be sure that you whitelist option hotline in your email client such that uh, you will be sure that you get our emails. And I'm gonna cover that uh, on your screen right now. Uh, okay, so uh, again, Please be sure, uh, uh, as far as the Option Hotline website is concerned, under the contact page, we have uh, two buttons here. Uh, the first one is how to whitelist Option Hotline, if you don't already know. And then we also have a contact card with all of our contact information. And you're more than, well, uh, more than welcome to download that. We encourage you to download that. And we would love to have you uh, contact us. Also, if you have any questions that come up after 
uh, we finish this webinar, uh, please reach out to us at webinars at optionhotline.com. We'd love to hear from you, webinars at optionhotline.com. And just to uh, continue the tour very briefly, I'm gonna go back to our about tab for those of you, uh, for those that are still with us. Uh, on our website, our about tab tells you a little bit, of course, about option hotline. And it gives you our mission statement, our statement of our values. I'm gonna pause for just one second so that you can read it very briefly. And then continuing on in our About tab, we do have a tremendous stable of commentators. Uh, across the top row here, uh, Keith Harwood is our Chief Options Strategist. Our next webinar is gonna be from Dr. Kerry, uh, Carry Dr. Duke Given, you see his picture second, and he's gonna be on the 17th. So we do, uh, we do invite you to come back and look for the invitation for that. Uh, Chuck Hughes is next beyond that. Uh, he's a regular commentator with us and he's got uh, some scheduled webinars coming up with us. And then Dan Passarelli actually did our very last uh, webinar and that's in the archive of the recorded webinars. So uh, if you missed Dan's webinar uh, uh, back last week, uh, that's in our archive. And then just lastly, I'm going to go to uh, the aforementioned webinars uh, calendar. We have great free ed education. Uh, you see today's webinar that we're just about done with. And then on the 17th, uh, you see probabilities, risk, and the pattern of returns with Dr. Duke, Dr. Kerry Given. Dr. Duke, that is. And again, you see uh, today's topic, but also uh, the last three webinars are featured here. And then we have an entire uh, backlog of all, uh, an entire archive of all of our last webinars. So you can go back months of our webinars and uh, you can see the headline and then just click on it and you'll get the full recording. Um, below that, you see uh, Guy Adami, who was with us today. He did a webinar with Chuck Hughes about a month ago, and that's right below there. So we do invite you to check out our webinars page, and we have a lot of great information uh, in our past webinars, and then, of course, our calendar of upcoming webinars. So that pretty much uh, finishes it. Once again, uh, please look for that email. Uh, please whitelist Option Hotline to make sure that you get all of our emails. And then please look for the email tomorrow that will have a, a link to the recording. You'll have information about uh, the free giveaway of the Trade Finder service and information about uh, Rob's courses. So we, uh, the, the zigzag mastery course. So we invite you uh, to please uh, look for that email tomorrow and please join us on the 17th uh, for Dr. Kerry uh, Duke, Dr. Duke Given. So uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, Natalie, if you're still on, anything else you wanna add? Nope, you covered it, Steve. Thank you everyone for attending and we'll see you at the next one. Terrific. Thank you, everyone, uh, for attending, and we will see you on the 17th. Bye, guys.